raw visual information, right? Such that we did with the uh, that fashion MNIST data, right, into the fully connected layer. Noted that was pretty chunky amount of processing this system had to do in order to make that work. It had to have a pretty deep fully connected structure. A lot of weights in there, a lot of risk of overfitting because of a lot of weights in the system. So as a result, it takes a lot, a lot of data to solve that problem and we run into that issue that it's often harder to train the system on all that data than we really had at the beginning of the process. The autoencoders are susceptible to that same idea. They're, they're FCs, they're fully connected networks, all right? Only in the sparsity do they stop being fully connected, all right? And they're still only sparse to the degree to which we penalize them to be. The idea here is that autoencoders stop being as popular as they used to be because people found out that you could get a little bit more stability by using things like the dropout layers and the regulation, regularization layers, as well as using sequential convolutions to accomplish the same thing with quite a few less parametrics, okay? So we got into a space where using the kernel to do feature extraction versus adding an entire another layer to this fully connected network wasn't a real big, wasn't a real good trade-off with respect to the complexity of the system. That and, as I mentioned beforehand, people like John LeCun, who's considered to be one of the granddaddies of deep learning, he was working on autoencoders and deep belief networks before he moved into the convolutional neural networks and really started working with those. The reason why they spiked in popularity, thank gamers, once again, I say this, thank gamers, it's video cards. Why we don't use autoencoders for even vision processing, despite the fact that they're able to produce roughly the same computational result in their outputs, is just because these are harder to accelerate in that same way. Right? The parallelization may come into play where we actually might move back to a fully connected autoencoder framework if we get to a point where we can create sort of miniature neural chip systems. Right? A lot of people are thinking about these. The other thing about these that's interesting is you have the ability to fully backprop through the entirety of the layer. Whereas with the convolutional systems, they use a greedy layer-wise approach to be able to maximize the activation of the kernel functions. Thus, it takes them a lot longer to converge. So the training time of a convolutional neural network can actually be longer than an uh, autoencoder, right? But the trade-off is that the autoencoder's size initially is usually quite large. It may actually be bigger in terms of memory requirements than the, comp the comparable CNN. Okay, um, I've, I've already talked about this enough. I, this is one of those circumstances where it's like, Okay, whatever. Um, so, one of the things that we end up with in autoencoder spaces is that their capacity to understand some of the latent characteristics of the system make their ability to differentiate similarly internal process structures a little more vague than something like a CNN. Notice that these are latent representations. We see this is, I think this is supposed to be an eight. I think that's supposed to be a three. But they look uh, very similar. They look incredibly similar yeah. in the latent space compression. Why? Because we've learned kind of this generalization framework in the process of encoding latent space. Since we haven't really created sort of a distinct pathway consideration for every particular sort of letter to go through like we thought about with each kernel finding the appropriate subcomponent of the system, we're gonna end up with a little bit of muddiness as a result of that higher compression of the latent space. These are actually the expanded versions of these. These are actually the output spaces whenever we take the sample from the input space. So this, this is a indication of a, um, of a real problem within standard autoencoder spaces, okay? We'll talk about variational autoencoders later on that allow us to be able to sort of uh, soft, soft solve this fix, right? Or soft solve the system. But I want to move forward a little bit and talk about how uh, we actually end up getting structures, all right? So I'm going to go through this pretty quick for variationals, all right? So we said this is natural latent space, right? And variational autoencoders do what? Solve a problem by what? Gaussian priors. Okay, so 
given some understanding about the, uh, the prior case likelihood of the system, they're actually utilizing the distributional mechanics of the input space to regularize which of the features end up getting stored in the latent space. So they're providing a little bit more information to the encoder decoder framework to be able to get it to stop fitting to generalize stuff, okay? What I'm actually doing here, what I'm actually describing is saying that these priors relate to the likelihood of the elements relative to the class component. So this says, I'm actually going to characterize how the information gets compressed relative to the class it's a member of. This is the way in which we actually start to add some degree of labeling characteristics to the autoencoder system. This, does it, this means that it's no longer unsupervised, fully unsupervised. It's being given density information, right, or generating density information based upon the frequency of multiple samples. So previously, what was it doing? It was looking at a single sample and looking at what it could get out from it. Now it's looking at the distribution of how all those samples work together and trying to figure out how the representation, the latent representation, could be the best at both compressing as well as differentiating the elements in the latent space. So by adding the components of the variance with respect to the Bayesian inference structure, we actually get the latent projection to have a better distribution for separability because that prior is going to map it in such a way as to create maximum distance relative to the latent representation space for each of the classes represented here. So it, cre it creates a offset here, right? Sample from the standard Gaussian distribution space that utilizes a, this inference for the encoder system to be able to map maxim maximization of the bottleneck feature space, right? We're talking about the feature space, we say bottlenecking is where the original input value space goes to a goes to that tight point in the center, right? That tight point in the center is said to be where we can maximize our understanding of what was originally represented in the, in the first order space. The idea is that the generalization of being able to encode the original values to the output values is a improvement over the standard system, okay? We don't get fuzzy mixed up faces or fuzzy mixed up letters. We get a more definitive contrast such that the encoding and the decoding phase create unique pathways through the structure that represent their ability to be descriptive of the density of that class relative to the density of all classes in the system. The problem is that that latent space distribution becomes a little bit unstable whenever you start having lots and lots of classes. Okay, it's not a, it's not a high it's not a multi-class system that's going to work at high high numbers. Okay. Um, you guys oh, want to look at this? Uh, crying inside. <laughs> and what, what do we notice here? What's this? Probability, Probability right? Uh -huh. characteristics, characteristics of candidate QZ. All right, what was Z, Z earlier? Z is that, uh, that's the latent space, right? Mm -hmm. X translates to Z. Mm -hmm. So we're going to create a series of candidate latent spaces. Right, so we're going to effectively train a series of autoencoders, or we're going to talk about how the autoencoders merge. And then we're going to say, how well does QZ represent probability linking back to ZX? Right? How, well can, how well can Z be related back to X given this late representation? Okay? That's the probability of reconstruction that's utilized using what's called KL divergence. Right? This KL divergence is written down here in a longer form. And it is related to what? Logarithmic distance metrics, which we know exactly how those work because we've seen those previously with regard to the uh, categorical cross entropy, right? So cross entropy analysis in uh, classification networks utilizes a very similar mechanism, right? Likelihood in class or likelihood of log Z distribution characteristics relative to likelihood of map Z X distribution this is how well we think that particular type of sample can effectively be reconstructed with respect to knowing what type of sample it is, okay? 
Uh, ultimately, this system comes back to understanding and trying to map the likelihood as the summation of all possible outputs relative distribution. So each class will get, in, get value, a valued index possibility. We're then going to take what? We're going to take the maximized valued index possibility and consider that to be the class of the sample space. But we're talking about this here with regard to the construction of the encoding framework. We're saying that we're actually going to decide which encoding framework works the best based upon how well it can actually differentiate each of the classes from one another. Okay? It maximizes the variance of the representation of latent space in order to preserve, maximally preserve, the capacity for classifiability when it is reprojected by the decoder portion of the framework. Okay, I'm going to keep going from here. Um, this is the idea that we said previously that if I unfold the network, right, so the first variational autoencoder is kind of the first of the generative networks, right, the first GAN was effectively running a, a variational autoencoder backwards, right, treating the latent space component noise between the samples to originally learn the variance characteristics of each of the classes, and then what, inside the variance, inside the latent variance space, if I sort of trigger the right sequence of activations in the latent space, what's going to happen? It's going to produce a sample that is like those samples, right, but effectively representative of the variance that could be designed within the system. So I train it on all ducks, okay, and then I learn the concept of duck, all right, then I pick what kind of duck I want to make, right? It's, you know, be a mallard duck, right? I highlight the right things. Then I add a rubber, a rubber duck. Rubber, duck. <laughs> rubber ducks are also a classic duck. I said we're training on all ducks, right? <laughs> so we're gonna add some noise to it, and then what's gonna happen? We're gonna, we're gonna pick duck, right? But we're gonna say rando duck, okay? And then it's gonna reconstruct, it's going to put out and, and try to think about what, what is required to be able to reconstruct that signal and it's going to build a picture of rubber duck. So how can we consider that to be utility to us? We already know kind of how this works whenever we utilize it for something like convolutional network, but we also know that the autoencoder, since it can accomplish a similar purpose, can work in the same way as a generative tool. So the, while the variational autoencoder maximizes the retention capacity, the understood class variance characteristics of the original distribution sample space, so that whenever we're utilizing the variational autoencoder as part of the sample reconstruction from the latent space, from a randomized latent space, we know that it's going to do a better job at creating a representative sample of the original value type. Right? Otherwise, it would create something like what we were looking at beforehand when you're running the decoder, a muddy kind of questionable overlap between the ways in which some of the letters can be written similarly. And if you happen to miscategorize at least one number, or a few numbers into the wrong space based upon similar items, similar characteristics, you're not actually getting the classifiability output of the system. So the original autoencoder projection, guess what? It didn't have any knowledge that all of those numbers were different. It just had, it just had the desire to try to project them into a latent space, right, based upon their structural considerations. So since we didn't tell it that three and eight were different, they said they were very similar to one another, so the latent space conflated them together. But since we've made it very clear to the system that three and eight are different, it now tries to maximize the understanding that threes are treated in this way, eights are treated in this way, based upon semantic elements of the construction, such that I can get a reasonable representation of a two from the system because it knows the prior. It knows relative distributional characteristics of the class that that particular sample was a member of. So that supervised implementation on top of the other methodology was an improvement in process here, okay? Um, this, is a, uh, th this is a little bit of an archaic process to doing so. I like, like I said, I like these visual examples about the idea of projection into latent space based upon representational value and then the attempt at the decoder to reconstruct a value from the latent space distributions because we get here an understanding of the encoder value or encoder value superimposed on 
things like the standard deviation and mean of the original sample space projection, which do what? They standardize the latent space so that it can be more adequately reprojected. Okay, better example of what I was talking about earlier. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to go and uh, I had to go and find this. So um, we say here that as long as we understand that the sample normalization happens with regard to relatively Gaussian characteristics for the system, that we can utilize just the understanding of the standard deviation in order to maximize the likelihood of the autoencode space. So we take the consideration of the deviation of the sample class, knowing that we have a, a, a sort of a spread with respect to a, 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 a known Gaussian style distribution for the latent space. It's a much more sort of, I guess you say, a much more sort of realizable and understandable uh, version of the system, okay? We'll talk about GANs next time, probably gonna pop through those pretty quick. Everybody's pretty familiar with how they operate for uh, CNN style GANs, uh, but they actually work in a similar way to the autoencoder system structure because they have a um, generative network, all right, and a discriminative network that they operate based upon. I think I analogized this earlier to when we were talking about it, that the generator network is effectively the arc forger, okay? So this is the forger, and this is the arc critic. Now the interesting relationship of the system is, as the forger effectively is looking at the corpus of all work within the system, the arc critic is as well, right? Mm -hmm. But the, the forger's job is to try to reconstruct something that the art critic is incapable of differentiating from the known characteristics of the original distributions. So since it's trained on the real thing, right? This is like a bank teller. You guys know the bank tellers never deal with anything but real money. They don't ever show them fake money. They only just show them real, right? That way when they pick up the fake money, what they do? They go, what's this? This isn't money, right? I know what money feels like, okay? This is, I know what money feels like, okay? <laughs> This is the person printing money, right? <laughs> the Xerox machine, okay? <laughs> they get a little better, right? They get up to the printing press level, then they start synthesizing their own little, you know, strips that go in the money. They get the, they get the really good presses, all that kind of thing. That's all that's really happened in generative network is it's getting better at fooling the other guy. Now what happens is that the other guy also is getting better at being able to tell when it's being fooled. Both these systems are developing with one another such that the discriminator network will actually get good and general at being able to tell fake images apart from one another. But the real problem is, when do we stop training it? When it actually gets to about 50-50 for its capacity to be able to successfully identify yeah. the fake ones, right? Because at equal probability, you're never gonna overfit, right? You haven't overfit to it. Can you overfit in a generative space? Kind of, in such a way as the same thing we were talking about earlier, if you provided the right appropriate set of model inputs to the space, you could theoretically reproduce one of the images that you learned from. Someone actually got mid-journey to output a picture of the Mona Lisa that was really pretty solid, okay? The actual picture of the Mona Lisa. It's a proof that it was trained on that data it's a proof that that data is in there somewhere, right? It's also a proof that all the other things that it was trained on are also in there, which means that all for all of their talk about how the model is so creative and generative, no, it's just taking bits and pieces from everything that's all put together and doing what? Recombining them together using some Gaussian inference framework and then trying to pawn them off on us as if it's actual art, okay? We need to be a better art critic. <laughs> Thank you guys, I'll see you next week. I'm going to put out an assignment for you guys to start working on for uh, doing some transfer learning, okay? So we're going to transfer learn a little bit, then on the final project we'll transfer learn a couple of directions, and then we're going to do some uh, segmentation, and then we're going to do a, gen uh, a, GAN, a little bit of a GAN training. We're going to do a little style GAN. I'm going to have a contest for you guys, all right? Whoever builds the best images with the style GAN, the best pair of images with the style GAN, I'll, I'll come up with a prize for you something fun, okay? So it gives you an incentive to try to work hard and get good at this stuff. <laughs> As if you need one. You guys all care about this. I appreciate that. Have a good weekend.